On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Deschutes County and the City Club of Central Oregon, welcome to our candidate forum for Central Oregon Community College Zones 5 and 6. Our candidate forums are conducted according to league guidelines and all candidates who have filed have been invited to participate. Candidate Michael Seip withdrew from the race yesterday and David Price was unable to attend due to a last minute emergency. All candidates, um, we, we welcome all the candidates who are participating. We appreciate the gravity of the decision to run for office. Our moderator this evening is Jerry O'Brien, editor of the Bulletin. Jerry, would you like to begin? Certainly, thank you, Carol. Um, hello, my name is Jerry O'Brien. I'm the editor for the Bulletin and uh, I'm the moderator for the Central Oregon Community College Board Zones 5 and 6 Candidates Forum. A seven-member seven board of directors governs Central Oregon Community College with members of that board elected from geographic zones within the district. The district covers about 10,000 square mile area, making it bigger or larger than most of uh, some eight areas in the United States. This forum is hosted this forum we are hosting, COCC Board of Directors Candidates for Zone 5, which covers Bend. And those candidates include Erin Mertz and Diane Berry. Zone 6, which covers Sisters and Black Butte, includes Maureen Radin, um, David Price, who cannot be with us tonight, Jim Porter, and Kevin Knight. We'll start with a uh, one-minute opening statements, followed by questions where each of the candidates will have one minute to answer. At the end, the candidates will have a two-minute uh, closing statement time. Candidates, the candidate order will be uh, rotated throughout the, the questioning. So let's get started. And with that, um, Diane Berry, if you would please give your first opening statement. Thank you. And thank you to the League of Women Voters and City Club for hosting this forum. I'm running because I'm passionate about education and about community colleges. I see them as a stepping stone to so much more, a degree, a certificate, a lucrative career, an end to generational poverty. Their impact is truly life-changing. I started my career at practicing family law before I got my master's in social work and ran a mental health clinic for 12 years. I've taught at four different colleges. For the past 12 years, I've been with Purdue University Global. I'm also a mom that has guided children from preschool through college, uh, dealing firsthand with school-related issues. This experience has enabled me to successfully navigate the complex and often intersecting issues in the fields of law, social work, and higher education. This breadth of experience enables me to see issues presented through a variety of lenses and to see solutions others may miss. It uniquely qualifies me for this position, and I would be honored to represent board Bend on the board. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Erin uh, Mertz, you're up next. Thanks, Jerry. Good evening. I'm recovering from a cold, so please uh, forgive my voice. My name is Erin Mertz, she, her. I feel I'm also uniquely qualified to serve on COCC's board. I've spent the last 20 years working in education-centered organizations, including eight recent years in Oregon public higher ed. I now work at Cascades Academy, a local PK through 12 school. I was a senior administrator and instructor at Portland State, the number two transfer school for COCC students. PSU is a high transfer urban university and like COCC, it has a high commitment to access and affordability. I witnessed firsthand how community college jumpstarts opportunity through education, interrupts generational poverty, fuels a strong workforce and fills society with critical thinkers and change makers. Now working in K through 12, I'm in touch with today's students and education's evolving landscape. My education experience both inside and outside the classroom would bring valuable and relevant perspective to the board. Thanks. Thank you. Uh Kevin Knight, your opening statement, please. Sure. Well, let me add my thanks to the League of Women Voters and City Club for putting this forum together. I appreciate that very much. Um, I'm Kevin Knight. You know, I'm semi-retired. I've uh, spent decades as a senior C-suite executive um, with uh, a number of multi-billion dollar companies. Um, I have a history of community service and involvement. I'm currently serving on the Bend Budget Committee, and also I've served on parks and rec boards, um, college advisory boards, nonprofits such as public television and radio stations, 
as well as a number of uh, corporate uh, boards, both public and private. So I'd like to take the skills uh, and the experiences that I've gained over decades of experience and add those to those uh, currently on the board and uh, really help ensure the future success of COCC. I am passionate about it and uh, you know it plays a unique role and it's critical to the success of the community as well as to the students who attend. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jim Porter, your opening statement, please. Good evening. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for uh, giving us this forum. Uh, I'm a career public servant, and I've also got experience in the private sector. I bring to the board uh, what the other what the other candidates really don't. I've been a student at COCC. I've been a faculty member at COCC. I've helped write policy at COCC. I'm very passionate about COCC. Both my daughters obtained their degrees there, and my wife finished her registered nurse license there. So I bring to the board a prospect from inside and outside. I have a history of uh, managing tax dollars here in Central Oregon. I've been a, I was a member of the uh, City of Bend's executive management leadership team for seven years. I've served on numerous boards throughout Central Oregon that, that service all of Central Oregon, just not Bend, from the Boys and Girls Club to the Central Oregon Law Enforcement Board. And presently, I am uh, the president of Central Oregon Villages, who we're building shelters out for individuals in need. I believe I bring a perspective that none of the others have, and I have that public and private business ship experience. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, Maureen Radin, your uh, opening statement. Thanks for having us tonight. Yes, my name is Maureen Radin. Uh, my family and I have lived in Bend for about six years. Um, we have a 14 year old in the Bend Lapine School District, so we're not in the college decision um, arena quite yet, but we'll be entering that, um, I'm sure, very soon here. Um, I'm currently in the workforce, as is my husband. Um, he's an architect. I'm the general manager for the Broken Top Community Association. Uh, my educational background is I have a bachelor's in communications, <laughs> excuse me, from UCLA. And I went back to UCLA a handful of years after that to uh, get my MBA. Um, while I don't have any direct experience as a public servant, um, my work in homeowners association management for 20 years uh, means I've worked with and guided boards through many difficult projects. So I'm very familiar with board governments, policies, um, how boards operate, and I would be glad to be of service. Okay. Well, our first question goes to you, Maureen. And uh, the, the question is, how many COCC board meetings have you watched or attended? And you can kind of expand on that if you would like. All right, looks like I got put on a mute again. Um, so I, I be perfectly honest, I have not watched any of them. I've gone through and looked through um, the past minutes that are on the website and the agenda to familiarize myself with some of the topics that they've been talking about. Um, in full disclosure, I decided to run because I saw an article that no one was running. I'm, I'm not sure if that's the other candidates reasons for raising their hands as well. I'm kind of surprised that any of you are here to be perfectly honest. I thought it would be just me. So um, I'm not necessarily running a campaign or doing a whole lot of background work. Um, I'm relying on my experience running boards and just being a citizen in the community to, um, to be able to participate. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, Jim Porter, a question goes to you. How many COCC board meetings have you watched or attended? I watched them clear back to December of last year. I've only attended one via Zoom, not in person. Uh, it was very interesting. I brought, I brought a great deal of respect for the board and the direction they've set and their fiscal responsibility specifically and how they've been very, very innovative in developing revenue streams, which will support them long into the future. All right. Um, Jim Knight. Uh, Kevin. Oh, I'm sorry, Kevin. Kevin, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my apologies. Uh, no problem. Uh, so I have not attended any, but I have watched uh, board meetings back into, I don't know, October, November of last year. Um, and I have also reached out to individuals at the college. I've met with met with them separately to kind of get their perspective on things as well. Um, you know, what uh, what they think is working, what they, you know, what they'd like to see improved, et cetera. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I would echo kind of Jim's view of the board. I think you know, I, I'm impressed with the people that are on the board. Uh, I'm impressed with uh, the progress that they've made at this point. I think it's about getting, you know, getting the college to the next step and building on the success that they've already achieved. 
Okay. And my apologies. I had a roommate in college named Jim Knight. So <laughs> uh, Aaron Mers, uh, how many COCC board meetings have you attended or zoomed in on? Yeah, I've attended one. I went to the in-person meeting uh, last month, which I really enjoyed. We had an opportunity to hear from some um, stu some students who've really excelled at the college. And so it was um, great to be there, witness that in person. Otherwise, similarly um, to some of the other candidates, I've gone back and reviewed minutes and I've also met with a number of board members on a couple of occasions. And I have also met with faculty and staff and leadership at the college. Okay, and uh, Diane Berry? I also attended the April meeting in person and it was, I agree, it was very interesting. I've also gone back and reviewed the videos of about six previous meetings and I've looked at uh, agendas and notes from meetings back to about a year and a half ago. Um, I also went out to the college and met with the presidents and several of the vice presidents and one of the board members. Okay, well, thank you. So this next question is kind of a two-part question, but um, we'll ask the first part and then answer that, and then I will ask the second, but I'll give you a kind of a preview of it. We need to keep tuition affordable, but we also need to pay the staff competitive wages, which means large salary increases across the board. What is your plan to secure more money for salary increases? The second part of that question is, what can, we, can be done to keep tuition affordable? So first of all, let's talk about salary increases. And the first question goes to Erin Mertz. Great, thank you. This um, subject matter is really close to my heart, having been a staff member at a public university here in Oregon and also an instructor for eight years. Well, I was a staff member for eight years. Um, people um, are the greatest expense of any college or university. COC is, C is no exception to that. Uh, and they're also the most valuable asset. Um, qualified, effective faculty staff are the lifeblood of any successful educational institution, hands down. Um, and I believe they should be fairly compensated. Um, you know, I know in speaking with Dr. Chesley that um, increased wages is a priority for the college. And so am I supposed to be answering both parts in this one minute? Uh, no. No, I'll okay. Um, and so okay. I know it's a priority of the college and I would continue to advocate for equitable wages, especially those that meet the increased cost of living in Central Oregon. Yes, sorry, that was a trick question on my part. But... Okay, I, I panicked there for a second. Okay, <laughs> okay so first part of the question, Diane Berry, um, what can we do about salary increases and uh, keeping uh, large salary increases across the board for uh, staff? I agree that our, our uh, staff, our faculty, um, everyone who works at the university certainly des deserves to be paid a living wage and Bend is a very expensive place to live. So we need to pay them in a way that we need to compensate them in a way that they can live in the community that they work. Um, that being said, I think we can raise revenues, but maybe not give them top of the line salaries, understanding that enrollment is down and perhaps the state isn't funding colleges uh, the way we would prefer that they would um, and look at other, other opportunities for funding that I guess is the second part of the question that I'll get to when you ask me that. Mm -hmm. But what, I, what I'd like to suggest is giving them a healthy increase, but um, maybe not making it the top of the line, but making it healthy enough that they can, can live here where they work. Okay. And Jim Porter, what do we need to do to keep staff competitive wages paying for the college? Staff? No, yeah, I have a lot of experience in that the, as a chief of police of the city of Bend and also as the, uh, as a manager of Central Oregon Villages. It's, it's a challenging time now. It's especially with colleges because <clears> there's more <throat> than one partner in there. We Not only do we have the external partners where the money's coming from, we also have the internal uh, people engaged. It takes, it takes discussions with the unions. It takes a, a recognition that not all individuals of high quality and high quality and high um, credentials want fiscal money. Some of them want incentives that in their benefits package that aren't related to money. And that's what we, we did at the Bend Police Department to increase uh, our staffing, our staffing levels. Um, the second thing is we really need to take a look at uh, equity amongst the uh, entire faculty equity amongst those supporting the faculty and make sure all those are correctly aligned with what the cost of living is here. Those are all challenges because the school is only as good as its faculty 
and as management and as support staff. So unless we're able to align all of those and bring them into a, a significant pay situation, or, or at least compensation is a better word to use, because again, not everybody is looking for dollars. And there's a lot of innovation out there that we have practiced in the city of Bend that we can do that without having a fiscal impact. Okay. Maureen Radin, pay for staff. Thank you. Yeah. So um, as an employer myself, I um, have seen how we've had to adjust wages, um, not just this past year, but even a little before that. So um, it's certainly top of mind. Um, I kind of feel the same way as Jim, as far as, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, different ways that people can look at compensation. I think that the communities where COCC campuses are located offer tremendous um, lifestyle and opportunity to just um, enjoy the beauty of our area, but that's only a benefit if you can afford to live in one of those places. Um, I'm sure there are also some benchmarking studies that have been have been done or could be done um, to make sure that the wages are fair and consistent with um, community colleges in similarly sized areas um, within our state or neighboring states to make sure that the wages are competitive with what we're seeing elsewhere. Okay. And Kevin Knight, wages for staff? Yeah, so this is uh, this is near and dear to my heart as well. Both of my parents worked in the pub, worked in public education, and and uh, my father in particular worked two jobs the entire time I was growing up uh, because of because of teacher salaries. Quite honestly, loved the work, but didn't pay all that well. Um, so this is this is critical. I mean, we need to provide excellent instruction for our students, and in order to to do that, you know, we need to attract, we need to hire, we need to <clears throat> the best instructors. Um, and that requires, you know, competitive wages. Um, you know, the challenge is that 80% of the budget for the college is really salaries and, you know, personnel related expenses. So there's not a lot of wiggle room in the, in the budget today. So what do we do about that? Well, first, you know, first and foremost, as, as board members, I think we advocate. Uh, we advocate at the state level, uh, joining our voices to others to get, get the proper funding, you know, from the state. Um, you know, Oregon has historically been below the, the national average in terms of, you know, the amount of money that they're putting into, you know, higher education. Um, one okay, I'm going to have to cut you off there. I'm sorry. Rank, rank them at 34th in the nation. Um, so I think we, we need to advocate. We need to, you know, look for creative new revenue sources um, in the partnerships that we're, we're building at the company. Okay. Well, actually, now the second part of this question comes back to you as well, uh, Kevin, and that is what can be done to keep tuition affordable? He's muted. Oh, you're on mute. I'm sorry. There you go. Okay. Um, at the same time, we're providing you know, livable wages for, you know, for our staff, we need to make sure that we're maintaining, you know, affordability for our students. I mean, that is, that's one of the key roles of, of uh, community colleges. Um, and we do that basically with support, right? And we, we do that with, you know, grants and we do that with scholarships and we do that with, um, you know, um, working with community. Uh, and so providing them the resources that they need uh, to to cover their tuition and to cover their education. Um, and, you know, there's some creative ways that we can do this differently than what we're doing now with is, for example, short-term scholarships. You know, rather than, you know, broad scholarships, you know, we can look at micro scholarships or short-term scholarships where, you know, we provide money to, uh, to students. And uh, once they complete, you know, a certain number of courses or credit hours, you know, they get the next, next tranche and they get the next tranche. And this does two things. It basically provides financial support uh, to keep, you know, their education reasonable, but it also provides motivation and incentives to, uh, to continue their education. Okay. One example. Thanks. Thanks so much. Keep, be aware of the clock, of course. Um, Jim Porter, what can be done to keep tuition affordable? Well, I think the first thing is it's got to be a Salem. We've got to get more pressure in Salem. We have to get more collaboration between the, the colleges or the community colleges in Oregon. Put more pressure on Salem. They're 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 doing a bit. Uh, they're doing a budget shift right now, and that needs to be shifted back to where there's there's greater uh, greater funding coming back to community colleges. I mean, they are literally the pipeline to what we see as urgently needed staff members. Where they you know look at our nursing crisis right now. 
all of that affects all of Oregon and all of us. The second thing we need to really focus on is the public-private relationships that the college has already been very good about, getting the private industry locally and its partners to help support fiscally training and training programs to help fill their line, open line positions in the, in the private sector. Uh, they've done that very well with St. Charles and the other medical providers here. That helps keeps the overall budget down. And lastly, I think they need to focus even more than they are on grants, federal grants. Uh, and that may mean hiring additional personnel or contracting it out. It's important because look at the vet, the grant bet, the grant we just got for the veterans on the college, and that reduces all of our tax burden and lowers the cost. Okay. Uh, Maureen Radin, uh, what can be done to keep tuition affordable? Thanks. Um, yeah, I would agree that state advocacy is important and not looking at COCC as um, you know, in a, in a silo as part of a bigger system um, to advocate for dollars on, on a bigger level. I think if community college isn't currently top of mind um, with legislators for funding, um, it definitely should be. Um, like Jim mentioned, you look at the job pipeline and what community colleges are training um, students to do, not just students who are um, typical college age students, but people who are returning to the workforce or looking for a change in career due to lots of different circumstances that we've all faced in the last couple of years. I think it's a really great time and a really great opportunity to show that value and to seek a return in that value um, from the legislation. And then aside from that, as a community member, I know I would be interested in participating in some level of fundraising. Um, it's not something that as a community member, I'm very aware of happening, but I think that could be an opportunity as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Erin Mertz, uh, tuition. Thanks. Yeah, the college has three primary funding sources. The top is property taxes, the second is tuition and fees, and then the third is the state. I absolutely agree that advocacy in Salem is, is essential, and we've seen declining trends in the appetite for the state to fund higher education. Oregon is, um, you know, below, below average per, uh, for per student um, investment. And so um, that's a problem. It's PK through 12 as well. And so we're, um, we have to kind of accept that, but I think more advocacy can definitely can be done. And I think ultimately we want to avoid the students um, shouldering that burden of additional operating costs, especially when you consider inflation. Uh, creative funding sources have been noted, and I think finding stable revenue streams, for example, the housing development that's going on in Bend right now to be um, a consistent and reliable stream of revenue for the college is a really great um, creative solution, and more of that is going to be required. All right. Thank you. Uh, Diane Berry. Well, I would concur with the adding pressure on Salem and advocating for more funding for our schools. I'm not sure how quickly that's going to happen, but I do think it's important to take that step. But the other thing, COCC has done something um, really um, strategic. They partnered with William Smith Properties. Aaron was kind of referring to this, um, the Campus Village project surrounding the culinary school. And again, this includes several hundred housing units, including single family homes with ADUs and more than 400 homes in multifamily apartment complex. This is going to provide much needed revenue for the college. And reduce the amount of tuition increase that's going to have to happen. It's not a it's not a fix all by any means, but it's going to increase the revenue that the college has, as well as maintaining some financial stability, providing a means of additional support to students and help alleviate the housing crisis in Bend. Now, ideally, I mean, it'd be appealing to think about this as affordable housing, but there, and there may be a place for that down the road, but this is not that step. The first step is to provide revenue for the college so we don't need to increase um, the tuition by a great amount. Okay. And actually, we will be getting to that topic in a little bit. <laughs> so this next question goes to Jim Porter. COCC has a strong history of fiscal responsibility through five presidents and countless changes to the senior leadership team. How do you see the board members' role in relation to this leadership and their fiscal long-term stewardship of the college? Yeah, we need to build on what they've established already. The board uh, has strong members there from different uh, different aspects, but I think our, our mainly our job will be is to help them provide innovation, is to do uh, to be an advocate for the school, 
to help them uh, ensure the decisions are made on on strong research that is validated that it's any decisions we make moving forward are uh, within the accreditation model and our best practices and it's just being able to tune and provide the entire services like was mentioned earlier from adults and secondary coming to secondary to the students coming in for the first time of the year so it's it's a matter of maintaining the goals that they've already set ensuring that there's that the fiscal the viable fiscal uh, models are followed and building off that now there's going to have to be some shifts over the next uh over the next few years because of the economy shifting i mean there's nobody saying the economy is in good shape right now so there's going to be some strong shifting in there and we'll have to make some hard decisions i say coming forward okay maureen raiden uh, the the board member's role in relation to its leadership and fiscal long-term stewardship sure so i i see a board's role in general as far as um you know supporting staff setting the vision um definitely keeping that long-term focus um where i've seen boards tend to go off the rails is when it's a knee-jerk or very reactive um type of um you know discussion about something that they feel needs to get fixed right now without looking at how this is going to have an impact down the road um you know when, while also looking back at prior decisions how effective have those been it is does the vision still make sense and when we're talking about staff retention and making sure that everyone who um is supporting the college and working working for the college you know they've got to understand that vision and be able to keep it up and maintain it as well um, you know, we're only going to be as effective as the group as a whole. Um, the board being on one page and the staff being on another isn't going to get anybody very far or lead to a whole lot of job satisfaction at the staff level. Okay. And Kevin Knight, the board member's role in relation to this leadership and their fiscal long-term stewardship. Sure. So in terms of kind of the relationship, the responsibilities of the board, it's really, you know, about helping set the vision accountability, over, which is oversight, uh, support and advocacy, helping and supporting um, the leadership of the college uh, and setting and setting policy. You know, I see those as kind of the overall responsibilities of this board and, and really just about any board. Um, they've done a good job on the fiscal side. The college is currently in, you know, strong, is, is in a good financial position, um, but the challenges lie ahead. Um, costs are, you know, running, high with inflation and, you know, revenues are going to be a challenge, you know, to offset those rising costs going forward. They have done some innovative things like sell the property uh, to bring in new revenue sources. Um, you know, uh, I wonder if there wasn't some other opportunities where in part of that deal, they could have cut a deal with, with the developers to provide some housing or at least provide a revenue stream out of that uh, to the college. Um, you know, there are probably, there are innovative ways to, uh, to you know, deal with some of the challenges that we're going to face in the future, but uh, okay. you know that's going to be one of the challenges of this board going forward. Yes, great, thank you, uh, Diane Berry. Thank you. Um, I concur that the college has been very responsibly managed in terms of fiscal responsibility um, in many past years, and I do see the relationship of the board to the leadership as the board really has the role of setting policy and setting the vision and then supporting the um, leadership and the staff to carry out that vision uh, and implement that vision. And then the board again comes in with a role of kind of overseeing all of that implementation. Um, I think they've done a good job in uh, recent years um, doing that, setting the policy and uh, overseeing it. But um, like others were saying, um, there are some challenges down the road, so maybe some changes will need to be be made, and this is the board that's going to have to take those on. All right, thank you very much. Maureen, this question. Oh, I didn't get to oh. answer that, Jeremy. Yeah, I was just oh, going to say, I think it's Aaron's turn. <laughs> that's okay. Did I miss and you? Oh, Aaron, yes, go ahead, please. Thanks, Jerry. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of need to echo here what most people said about the, the role of the board, certainly accountability um, of leadership and, and budget oversight. And the college, they've really been disciplined spenders and they have healthy reserves, which is really encouraging. Higher education is a 
facing a national crisis with the decline of enrollment and how colleges are responding to that. Um, you know, is really telling, especially after the pandemic. So I've been really impressed with how COCC has fared after the pandemic. Um, enrollment is largely flat and the tuition increase that occurred last month is below inflation, which is uh, encouraging. And it really keeps the college um, one of the most affordable community colleges in our state. So I think those are really um, key indicators for the, the health of the college. And um, yeah, it's certainly the responsibility of the board to um, ensure that responsible fiscal management um, moving forward. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so the next question, speaking of enrollment, um, for Maureen Radin first, um, what can be done to improve year-to-year -year student retention rates? Yeah, so I've, I've read some articles recently about um, credit loss and specific, specifically where that's talking about the concept that students are enrolling in classes at community college with the idea that they're going to transfer to a four-year school. And when they get to the four-year school, they're finding out that some of their credits didn't count, um, which is a very unfortunate loss of time and money and resources on that student's part to get where they want to go. So in that case, I think it's um, making sure that there's a focus on that student's path and that their time and their money spent at the college is getting them uh, where they want to go. And then as far as just retention, I think if you've got great instructors and you've got staff and a solid board at the college who genuinely care about the student experience, um, that's what's going to keep them there. Same, same reason that people stay at their workplace. They enjoy coming every day. They can't wait to come back. Um, they're engaged and, um, and focused. Great. Thank you. Kevin Knight, uh, how do you improve year-to-year -year student retention rates? Well, let's talk about enrollment as well as intent uh, retention. So, you know, from an enrollment standpoint, you know, there's a couple of different things that I think we need to focus on. Uh, you know, according to some of the research that's been done recently, some of the reporting is in terms of getting enrollment up, one of the keys to that is really getting high school graduation rates up and then providing, you know, an effective channel into college community or college community colleges and universities. The other one is our demographics are changing. The people that are attending our colleges is changing. So there needs to be a focus and an accommodation of older students who are, you know, coming back into the uh, college environment. Those two things will help improve uh, enrollment. With retention, you know, we need to make sure that we're removing the barriers to success. You know, so making sure that the basic needs of the students are being met. Um, you know, so they can focus on education, providing the financial, you know, uh, support so that we can make it affordable, you know, providing things like childcare, you know, to make it uh, possible for uh, people to come into the college environment, offering relevant courses uh, and providing a clear path, you know, to employment um, and really making education accessible. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jim Porter. Year-to-year -year student retention rates. Yeah, I agree with all what Kevin said. I think I think for me it starts with the staff. I think that the staff provide the environment to bring people back in, get them engaged heavily. The second part of it, I believe, is uh, affordability. Working on that scholarships, uh, keeping the cost of tuition low so people can actually afford to stay there. I think I think another major part of it is also the quality of the experience of the student there to make sure that they feel safe. Uh, they feel like that they belong there and it's a place where they are actually moving forward in their life. I think another thing Kevin touched on, I totally agree with is how relevant are the classes and degrees we're offering. I mean, we're seeing a major expansion in the electric vehicle area and the nursing area. And if we can bring those up and make those kind of the cornerstones to show the COCC is moving forward, is relevant. I think the next one is really focusing on uh, internships or work college experience at the same time, getting the local, uh, the local private industry to bring them in like they do with the nursing program into the hospital, maybe uh, proving our ability to bring the people who are studying electronic vehicles into our local auto dealerships, those kind of things. So they have the, so not only learning, they're also exercising what they use. And uh, okay. class is housing. I think if we can, if we can move towards an area where we can provide some affordable housing or low income housing for the students, they'll continue on through there. Thank you. All right, Erin Mertz. 
Thanks. Um, there have been some really great comments on this issue, which is a, an extremely complicated um, topic. Retention is multifaceted and it's very different depending on the, depending on the student and their circumstances. Um, I, to start, whole person success is critical. There are so many students that attend community college who have so many other priorities in their life that they're juggling, whether it's caring for children, other family members, working full time, you name it. A lot of the um, people in Bend um, at large, what people are struggling with here, you know, housing security, food security, transportation, childcare, those are the same challenges of COCC students. So I think um, empowering students to succeed both inside and outside the classroom is essential. Um, emergency funds, I think are really important, um, you know, in time funding to keep um, students enrolled. Um, faculty staff relationships, absolutely necessary. And then employability, what, what's at the end of the road? What's the return on investment sure. to ensure students are um, have a clear finish line and they can uh, see the value of their education at COCC? Great, thank you. And Diane Berry, year to year thank student retention rates. Thank you. How to do this in a minute. Um, COCC reports a 58% completion rate for students. Now, while this is over half, there's still 42% of students who are not completing their programs. And, and COCC has done some innovative things trying to improve the numbers of retention. And one is a program that provides added support to students in certain programs. And for these students, it provides early registration, academic advising, uh, financial assistance to help overcome financial and academic challenges. And these students are shown to have higher completion rates and academic performance compared to their peers. One step to improve retention and completion would be to provide these supports to all students who need or request them. And this could increase success rates across the board. Another thing is we have to look at why students aren't completing, aren't continuing. What are the barriers? And many of you have mentioned this. Is it, you know, food insecurity, um, houselessness? Is it childcare? Is it money issues? You can't afford the tuition and removing as many of these barriers as possible so the student can continue and succeed. All right. Well, thank you very much. Now, some of you have mentioned this in the past, but um, th this question focuses on COCC, which sits on more than 200 acres of land, much of it undeveloped. The college has previously engaged in long-term land lease agreements with developers, but so far, these have all been uh, for, market, for market rate housing projects. What do you see as COCC's role and the college board's role as being in the region's affordable housing crisis and what directions might you encourage the college to consider? And Diane, we start with you on this one. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I love the idea of affordable housing. I'm a volunteer with REACH, a local nonprofit that works with our vulnerable and unhoused population. So it's near and dear to my heart. And sitting on all of that acreage um, makes it, uh, gives it an asset that it, it can use to provide uh, something like affordable housing for students, but I think we have to be careful um, in order we're not so that they are um, wise and careful stewards of these assets. Uh, I'd like to see something like that developed. I haven't seen any numbers. I'd like to see something put together about how affordable it could be and the difference it could make to students. And perhaps, you know, that could accommodate for some tuition increase that um, students might be able to handle a tuition increase if they also get um, some type of affordable apartment um, as a return. So I, I'd like to see it happen. I haven't seen it yet. I'd like to see it in development and see what the numbers would look like. Okay, great. Erin Mers, the role of the board and uh, encouraging the college to develop some of its land. Yeah, um, COCC is land rich. It's one of the biggest property owners in the county. And um, I think as a, as a, you know, a taxpayer resource, I think that the college should play a significant role in solving the housing crisis in our county um, and in Bend, because ultimately um, I, I believe, I understand why the current units that are being developed are, are market rate units to prioritize the long-term financial sustainability of the college first and foremost, foremost right now. And I believe it can be a both and solution. Um, and I think beyond 
just how the college uses its its land assets really collaborating with the city in a very serious way because ultimately if people can't live here they're not going to go to college here and so it's going to have a long-term impact and nor can it um, recruit um, younger faculty and staff to potentially relocate to the area so i think it's a it's an important priority for the college all right kevin knight so yeah, so I, I touched on this uh, briefly before. Um, you know, I applaud the college for you know using the resources available to them to you know to drive some new revenue sources. They've been quite innovative, and I and I compliment them on the fact that you know uh, a share of these funds, uh, a large share of these funds, is really going to expand the accessibility of the college into other communities, particularly uh, the new Madras uh, facility that's being developed in as a result of some of these funds. Um, as I said before, um, you know, I think that as we look at these assets, you know, we need to be innovative and we need to be, you know, very smart about how we're, how we're using them, um, you know, as rather than just sell them and create revenue, are there some partnership opportunities here that can either drive, you know, innovative revenue sources into the, into the college or, um, you know, provide housing for our students or for our staff you know, how can we best use that? Um, the other thing I would say about the land is, you know, while attractive, while it's an attractive source, you know, of revenue and support for the college, I think we need to be careful that we take a look at the long run to make sure that, you know, we're not shortchanging the future of the college by short-term sales. Okay, thank you. Jim Porter. Yeah, I'm going to echo pretty much what everybody else said. I think the number one priority for me is what Kevin just touched on, that we're not using the land or selling the land immediately for immediate responses. We have to be looking at 10, 20, 30 years and base any land sales or land use on reliable, predictive uh, decisions. We just can't make them today. You know, but looking at the microcosm right now or looking close at it, I think what's important for me is, is they develop, again, some low income to zero income housing for students. They expand some of the land into some safe parking area for those students who can afford to live in a van or have a trailer or something like that. That is that that's very much very feasible. I think also they need to look at uh, utilizing some of the land or property to build a child care center. I just do, and it can't be COCCs. It has to be a public-private relationship where COCC provides the facilities, and it's they just can't afford to pay for babysitters. And last, it needs to be balanced. Every approach in this needs to be balanced with what we need today and what we're going to need for the next three to four generations. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Maureen Radin, uh, COC's land ownership. You're, uh, there. Sorry, got stuck on mute. <laughs> Tiny little <laughs> button there. Um, so, yeah, I... I I've heard a lot of great comments. I think as far as the board's role in this arena, um, it almost turns into a lobbying and PR operation, um, particularly for the Bend campus. Anytime you mention affordable housing, um, folks in that area around COCC are not tending to be advocates for that type of development. So I think we have an uphill battle um, just on the public side to explain the value and why that is so desperately needed. Um, there's a reason beyond just the market and revenues that that is being developed as market rate housing. Um, there's a lot of public pushback for anything with the word affordability in it, which is incredibly unfortunate. Um, and yeah, I, so I think the board sets the tone and the board would need to take a strong stance and hold a lot of potentially public town hall meetings to explain the value to the overall community. Okay, great. Well, Maureen, this one comes back to you. We start over again. Um, COCC has announced a branch campus expansion in Madras that will provide localized programs in nursing and early childhood education, as well as a 100 seat daycare facility open to the community. What is your position on this expansion and the future branch campus expansions? I think it's uh, such a wonderful opportunity for a historically underserved population to have the opportunity um, to pursue education at that level, to get some job training and also have resources and support like childcare to address some of those barriers that might've been in place that would have prevented some of those students from considering attending. Um, I think it's going in exactly the right place to um, 
you know, break down some generational uh, barriers that have been happening for folks who are probably going, uh, hopefully going to be very excited to have that campus right there in their community um, with um, some ease of access that previously didn't exist. All right, um, Jim Porter. Campus Can you repeat the campus. question for me, Jerry? Yeah, sure. The uh, COCC has announced the branch campus expansion in Madras. It includes a nursing and early childhood education, as well as a 100-seat daycare facility. What is your position on this expansion and the future branch campus expansions? Yeah, I support that. And what Maureen's talked about earlier is, even though we're, we're uh, applying our candidates for one zone, we have to work with all the zones. I've been lucky enough to uh, serve all three counties around us in capacities as a civic leader and as a private leader. Uh, and there's definitely different needs in different areas. This is, uh, I believe this is a really, really uh, sustainable model there. I believe it's a model that we can also bring back to Bend far as childcare, an important part is it's addressing the needs for additional uh, nursing positions, call them cohorts, groups of, you know, 13 nurses working together, and it expands it. It gives those individuals in areas that have not been as lucky as been economically to bring their students in to that area and make move them through this community colony process. It, uh, it just, Jefferson County is in dire need of this. Now, the COCC's job isn't to always stimulate the economy, but there is to be equal and fair dis distribution of their services. And it's just, it's a great model. It's very innovative. All right, thank you. Kevin Knight? Yeah, I support it as well. You know, access uh, to the education is absolutely critical. Uh, and by building this facility in Madras, we're, we're basically providing, you know, access to this community that badly needs it. Um, and uh, so I, I fully support that. All right. And Aaron Mers. Yeah, similarly, I fully support it. Um, it's really encouraging to see the college respond to the needs of our county. Um, and like what Jim said, um, yeah, we have to think outside our zone, certainly, and think of the broader uh, ways that the college serves the, the full district. Um, and uh, the child care, I'm really excited about that because I think um, with any luck, it's really successful and then it can expand to the other campuses. It will serve with any luck, um, you know, as a really positive model that could um, solve some of the uh, child who cares, child, uh, child care needs on some of the other campuses. So I think there's a lot of um, great outcomes anticipated. I'm yeah, definitely in support and certainly the access um, eliminating long commutes um, for students who want to attend on the ground programs now can do that um, right in their backyard, which is exciting. Great. Okay. And Diane Berry. I'm going to echo this. Um, I'm very excited about the expansion, uh, both about the child care center, which I think is sorely needed. We are in a, a child care desert, both in Madras and in Bend. And I would love to see this program continued in Bend as well, in that I would love to see a child care center on the campus, not necessarily run by the school, but a piece of land donated or uh, provided for the child care center. Um, but I'm excited that it's going to happen in Madras to provide care for uh, children of students, faculty, and staff, and to provide work experience for the child care uh, students there as well. And I'm excited about um, training additional child care workers because we have such a deficit and excited about the expansion of the nursing program. I can't say enough positive about that. But like I said, I'd like to include a child care center on the Ben campus as well and get that in the works, perhaps modeled on the one that they're doing in Madras, and it'll just kind of lay the groundwork for what we're going to see here. I think it's a great step. It's like we have a win-win across the board here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. This, this question, we'll start with Aaron Mertz for this question. Um, COCC has made great strides in remote learning during COVID. What is your position on remote learning going forward? I'm so glad I'm starting with this question. Okay. I taught remotely during the pandemic. Um, I know the challenges and opportunities uh, that come with remote learning. Um, I think it increases access and I wanna differentiate remote. Um, I, I consider remote as like synchronous, what we're doing right now. And then online um, typically is in asynchronous modality. Um, I think it definitely increases access, and I think 
faculty need to be empowered to be successful in a remote and online learning environment because it's very different than in classroom. And so um, in speaking recently with um, a member of COCC leadership, they've actually felt like they've struck a really nice balance post pandemic um, with the on the ground online and remote offerings. And they said remote um, tends to be the least favorable among COCC students. They prefer on the ground or online learning. Um, but I definitely think it's it's good to have hybrid options and a variety of options to meet um, students where they are. Okay. Uh, Diane Berry, your take on remote learning going forward. I'm very excited about remote learning. I've been working with Purdue University Global remotely for 12 years now. So I'm probably more versed on that than any of us here. <laughs> um, all of my teaching for them has been done remotely and it has been synchronous, meaning the students were required to attend a one hour seminar at the same time each week. And if they missed that seminar, they had to do an assignment in, in order to be able to get credit for it. I think that's a wonderful opportunity. We had wonderfully engaged students and a, an opportunity to have conversations with them to discuss the material we were learning. We would talk about it together and do exercises together in class. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to learn, especially if a student has any other type of obligation. If they have family to care for, either older peer, like parents that they're caring for or young children that they're caring for or having any kind of family responsibilities or if they have a full-time job. You know, many of our students, you know, are working. Maybe, maybe not a full-time job, maybe a couple of part-time jobs. I think I can't see enough good about remote learning. I think it's a real positive. There has to be a balance, but I think this is a real good step. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jim Porter, remote learning. Yeah, I was lucky enough to help set up a remote learning for uh, all of Central Oregon law enforcement when I was the lead in Central Oregon law enforcement board, also the chief of police in Bend. And it really, really uh, expanded our ability to meet the students where they're at and increase the amount of students who could attend. It also, they kept up the retention levels of the students through the entire process. So it was just a win-win for the students. Now, some of it has to be on the ground in the classroom. There's no doubt about that. But it's just, it's just facilitates the students' ability to attend and absorb education. The second area is, it's a good recruitment point for faculty. It's one of those things I talked about earlier. It's one of those benefits that's not in dollars. Some faculty, you can retain, you can recruit and retain really high-quality instructors if they know that they can work from where they're at rather than have to move to Bend where the um, cost levels are exceptionally high for housing. And lastly, I think it'll help increase uh, the graduation rates, undoubtedly. Uh, we're there, it's been, uh, it's being used. We're not gonna be able to pull back from it. It's just part of the normal standard now for schooling. Okay, great, thank you. Maureen Radin, remote learning. <laughs> yeah, I agree with Jim that we're we're in that mode now. It's not going anywhere. Um, and I think it's um, great to have that balance that sounds like it's been struck and they've found found a sweet spot already. So if it's if it's not broke, keep doing it. Um, I think it's also a great way to prepare students for the current workforce um, where there are flexible work opportunities, remote work opportunities. People are learning and adapting to how to find a culture and how to engage with each other um, in very different ways than we did in the past few to several years. Um, and if we can set that tone at, um, at this level in their education, all the better. Um, and I, I think as long as um, the faculty members who are in that role are enjoying it and comfortable with it, and they've got students who are thriving in that environment, um, then it's a great option to, to continue. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, Kevin Knight, your take on remote learning going forward. Yeah, so we talked about enrollment and we talked about retention earlier. And, you know, I think this fits right into that conversation because, you know, accessibility, you know, feeds the success in enrollment and retention. And this is a way to provide that accessibility to, to our students. And, and it's become it's becoming the norm. Um, and so, you know, I'm all for it. It's here to stay. Um, you know, I think it can be further, further developed. You know, I think it's important that um, teachers and instructors get trained in this. You know, I took some, I took some, I was taking some classes during the pandemic, uh, and it was clearly a, a learning process for both the instructors as well as the students. Uh, and so there's, you know, it's different, and it, it requires some training. So I think there's some support that needs to be provided, both in terms of training, and also making sure that the technology is there uh, to actually deliver it. And I agree with Jim. I think that one of the benefits of this uh, could be, 
you know, a way to deal with staffing um, and and those type of issues where we can provide an opportunity for them to work, you know, wherever they may be. All right, great. Well, we have time for one more question and then we will go to closing uh, statements. But this one starts with Maureen Radin. And the question is, what role will you take in supporting President Chesley's carbon commitment, which is a national national climate pledge to reduce COCC's carbon footprint. I just feel like he saved the hardest one for last year. I, yes, I can't um, <laughs> I can't claim to have a lot of knowledge or really any knowledge about that initiative. So what I what I could respond in general is it sounds like a, a wonderful way to support a green initiative um, and anything in that arena it will be right up my alley. I see the board's role in general, if this is a, a position that our president has taken and that's important um, to, to the president, that our role is to help make that happen and to help guide that conversation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kevin Knight. Carbon. Yes, this is obviously an important topic. Um, and, you know, as a college, we obviously have a carbon footprint. And so I think there's a number of things that, you know, we can do um, to do our share, if you will. And that is make sure our buildings are as efficient as possible. To the extent we're building new buildings, we need to make sure they're efficient. To the extent we've got old buildings, uh, as we, you know, as we address maintenance issues and have an opportunity, we can make those those buildings more carbon neutral. Um, you know, and everything from kind of soup to nuts that the um, university does, you know, we, we should focus and have specific goals that will reduce the carbon footprint uh, that we have as a college, as well as to, you know, make it a key point of learning for, for all of our students as well as our staff. Great. Uh, Jim Porter. Uh, I 100% support it. I'm really uh, appreciative of the president stepping up and taking a leadership role in all of Central Oregon by committing to that. Uh, exactly what you know. What Kevin said is we need to we need to check off all the boxes. We need to sure that we're upgrading as we go to all of, all of the facilities. But most importantly, we need to have those clear goals that Kevin always mentioned. And it's just puts us in a position once again to be a leader in the community. For all, all uh, businesses, public and private, and it's uh, I applaud her stepping forward for that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Diane Berry. Thank you, and I'm very impressed with President Chesley's um, uh, carbon neutral commitment. It's not the first step she's taken. The college administration has been responsive to concerns of students and staff and community members about our climate crisis. They've taken steps to reduce waste in the uh, food service areas. Uh, they've earned a recognition as a tree campus and a bee campus, um, being pollinary fr pollinator friendly. And I love the idea that these efforts are continuing. I could not stand behind her more strongly. Great. And Erin Mertz. Similarly, I'm not sure I have too much to add. Um, I echo the sentiments of the other candidates, certainly, and coming from PSU, where there's a strong emphasis on sustainability and carbon neutrality is also, um, you know, I've worked in that environment before, certainly absolutely supportive of Dr. Chesley and her um, her investment in prioritizing this for the college and, yeah, ensuring that um, buildings continue to be upgraded over time is certainly essential. And I think there's even smaller steps that um, anyone who's working within the college environment or um, even the students can participate in to, to help the college reach its goal. So yeah, I'm, I'm in support. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you very much, uh, all of you candidates. Uh, we're now going to a uh, closing statements. You have actually two minutes to respond to a closing statement. So uh, first, first up is Kevin Knight. Great, thanks, Jerry. Um, I think as closing, what I'll do is just echo some things that I said in the in the voters pamphlet. You know, I, I love the quote that says, you know, with education, you know, dreams become reality and the impossible becomes possible. And for Central Oregonians, you know, COCC plays an incredibly important role in that. You know, whether it's an associate degree that you're you're getting that's a, and you're on a path to getting a bachelor's degree, or whether you're seeking some unique certification or technical training, um, or just lifelong learning for the community, it's COCC that plays that role, and it's incredibly important for our community. And, and the reason I'm running is, you know, I'd like to help. 
Uh, I think I've got some unique experience to, to contribute to the board as a senior executive for, you know, for decades, you know, with high level responsibility, you know, in strategic planning and financial management and working with government agencies, um, you know, developing partnerships that expanded our reach and our profitability, you know, managing large and diverse workforces, you know, and developing new and innovative technologies. I think I've got the unique skills uh, to bring to this board. If, if you look at the makeup of the board today, it's, you know, it's a great board. You know, we've got attorneys on the board. We've got a representative a managing director for Chamber of Commerce in Madras. Um, you know, we've got uh, people in healthcare, people with government background. But what I can bring to the table and why I think I have, a, a, you know, a unique opportunity to contribute here is because, you know, I have that, you know, 40 plus years of, of business experience working in organizations, making them successful, helping them grow, uh, restructuring them when they're necessary, coming up with innovative solutions. You know, I worked in a very competitive and constantly changing environment. I think I can bring a lot to the board and I uh, would appreciate uh, appreciate your support. Okay, thank you very much. Jim, Par Jim Porter, two minutes closing. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with Kevin. When I look at my what I can bring to the board is I've, I'm the only candidate that's actually been a student at COCC. Both of my daughters are students at COCC. At COCC helped me go on to get my bachelor's degree in business management. They helped both my daughters go on to very successful careers, both in law enforcement as a fish biologist. They helped my wife uh, finish her RN. So I'm very tied to COCC. I'm the only candidate who has been an actually faculty member and taught there at COCC as a member of the uh, law enforcement curriculum. I'm the only member who has been a business partner with COCC from the outside and written uh, intergovernmental agreements with them. And I'm the only, the only candidate who has been asked to help write policy for the college. That's, that's my ties to the college. I feel very strongly about that. I'm the only candidate that's endorsed by two of the sitting members of the board right now. I'm endorsed by two past mayors, uh, endorsed by other members of the education community and other civic leaders. It's my past experience of serving all of Central Oregon on multiple boards, whether it was on the Boys and Girls Club board where I served all of Deschutes County, or whether it was on the Central Oregon Law Enforcement Board where I served all of Central Oregon, whether it was on the board where I'm president of the Central Oregon Villages where I'm in touch with all the assets of uh, providing housing. It's a matter of having a broad spectrum, which I've had, and I've been on the executive leadership team of the city of Bend for 10 years. And so I have an understanding of what it takes to move things forward in Central, in Central Oregon. It's uh, it's the footprint that I want to continue to move forward as COCC being a leader in the area. COCC touches more points in Central Oregon than any other business, private, or public. They just do. And so I, I really like to move that forward. And I believe I bring all my collaboration skills. I have a strong history of uh, leadership. I have a strong history of collaboration, of transparency in my uh, decision making. And uh I believe that I, I I would be do well on that board. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Maureen Radin. Thanks. I just um, want to say I'm glad to be part of this group. Um, this is my first time ever raising my hand for something like this. So it's been an education in local politics. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, I raised my hand because. Even when I put my application in and what I thought was the last minute, I guess it wasn't. Um, so um, it's it's been interesting to see um, really how this works. Just because I don't have any endorsements and because I didn't write a statement for the voters pamphlet, um, please don't let that be a reflection of my interest or my ability to serve. Um, let it be an indication of my lack of understanding of how this process functions. Um, I would just be glad to help. Um, I think that, um, you know, while I don't have decades, perhaps, of business experience on top of the 20 years that I've been in business, I am a current business person. I'm working in our community. I have a soon-to-be freshman in high school. Um, I think that offers a different perspective um, as far as how things are working in the world right now um, than, per, than perhaps some others would offer, or perhaps, um, you know, just, just a fresh perspective might be welcome. And um, again, I, as I mentioned in the beginning about my experience, all I do all day is work with board members. I'm very well versed in policy, <clears throat> governance. I've run multi-million dollar budgets myself. 
um, I'd feel very comfortable stepping into the seat. So I hope that people are listening and um, like some of the things I have to have to say. Okay. Thank you so much. Erin uh, Mertz, your closing argument. Statement. Thanks, Jerry. Well, folks are tuning in this evening um, so they can decide who to vote for. I'm going to give you five reasons or five ways that I'm different from my opponent to help inform your decision making. The first is I've experienced an Oregon public higher education. As previously mentioned, that experience was at PSU, the second highest transfer school for COCC students. Second, my experience in education is both broad and deep. I bring perspective from both inside and outside of the classroom, from academic affairs to student affairs. I've worked very closely with constituents at every level of an educational institution. Thirdly, because of this experience, I understand how educational institutions function, how decisions are made. I sit at decision-making tables still today in education and how those decisions impact all of the school's constituents. I'm a mid-career professional currently working as a senior P PK through 12 administrator here in Bend. I bring boots on the ground perspective, which I think is a very important perspective for this board. And I'm surrounded every day by potential COCC students. Finally, fifth, I'm endorsed by three current COCC board members, Jim Clinton, who currently represents my zone, zone five, Bruce Abernethy, and Erica Scaffold. Educators and other educational leaders have also endorsed me. They all believe that I have what it takes to be an effective board member at COCC. Beyond these differentiators, I'm a firm believer in the essential role that community colleges play in access to higher education and skilled trades. They capture human potential that may otherwise go unrealized. On the board, I'll be a voice for innovation, collaboration, and responsiveness to ensure that COCC is prosperous and an accessible asset to our community. I'll advocate for policies and processes that foster student success, create equitable opportunity, and ensure responsible budgeting to keep COCC affordable. I really thank you for your time, and I hope I can count on your vote. Okay, thank you. And finally, we have Diane Berry. Your closing statement, please. Thank you. I want to thank the League of Women Voters and City Club for hosting this forum again. My experience in law, social work, higher education, running a small business has <clears throat> enabled me to successfully navigate the complex issues and often intersecting issues in these fields and uniquely qualifies me for a position on the Community College Board of Directors. I am also a parent, and this breadth of experience enables me to see the issues uh, pre presented through a variety of lenses. Working as an attorney and family therapist, I have seen firsthand the harms caused by a lack of childcare, the inability to meet basic needs or access education. It can prevent individuals from becoming productive members of their community, perpetuate generational poverty and worse. Uh, my experience enables me to see solutions others may miss. I also feel called to give back to my community. I volunteer as a neighborhood coordinator with the Bend Food Project and with REACH, a local nonprofit that works with our vulnerable and unhoused neighbors. Uh, serving on the COCC board would be another excellent opportunity for me to share my education and experience with Central Oregon. As a mother and grandmother, it's important for me that not just my grandson, but all children and individuals have the opportunity for an excellent education. Participation on the board would be a way to help make that happen. And as a member of the board, I would seek to increase enrollment as we discussed and increase partnerships with local businesses to meet anticipated workforce gaps, reduce barriers, be it needing help to apply or assistance meeting basic food or housing or needing child, child care. Continue to expand housing options and increase revenue for the college, support our faculty and staff to be able to live in the community where they work, and work to increase child care via, via supporting the expansion of the Madras campus and advocating for a child care center on the Bend College property to provide care for children of students, faculty, and staff, and provide work opportunities for students. I believe my experience uniquely qualifies me to address these issues and to continue the strong work of the current board toward these goals. I would be honored to represent Bend on the College Board, and I would be honored by your vote. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. And, and thank you all uh, to the candidates for participating in the League of Women Voters of the Chutes County and the City Club of Central Oregon's Community College Board Candidates Forum, Zones 5 and 6. Your vote is your voice. Make sure you get your ballots in by May 16th so your voice can be heard. 
The next League of Women Voters of the Schutz County and City Club of Central Oregon Candidates Forum will be Thursday, May 4th, for the Redmond School Board Candidates, positions uh, 3, 4, and 5. It will be live streamed at 6 p.m. Please visit the City Club of Central Oregon's website to submit questions for the Candidate Forum. Forums will be streamed on the City Club of Central Oregon's YouTube channel, and recording links of the forums will be available at both the League of Women Voters of the Schutz County and at the City Club of Central Oregon websites. So, I am Jerry O'Brien, the editor for the Bulletin. I want to thank you all for participating and running for public office. It's very important. We're glad that you've stepped up to do this. Thank you once again for participating in tonight's forum. <laughs>